Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone here in the North Sanctuary, the South Sanctuary, those of our, you in our Speedway campus, and certainly those of you who are watching online, particularly we want to do a shout out today to Beth Ann, who is watching from Arizona. Let's give it up to Beth Ann and all those who have joined us online today. Thank you so much. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse 24, the Bible tells us that God wants us to run our lives to win. The Bible exhorts us to run the race of life in such a way that we take the prize. Not second place, or in the words of Ricky Bobby from Talladega Nights, first loser, but rather God wants you to be in first place. And so we are literally in one of the most important series that we could be in as a church to help you uh, do just that, to accomplish that in your life. We are unlocking the doors to the 30 biggest ideas found in the Bible that if not only understood but have embraced in your life by faith will put you on this path to success. In the first 10 weeks, if you were here, we unlocked uh, 10 doors uh, to the 10 biggest beliefs found in the Bible. And the idea the scripture teaches that if you take these beliefs and understand them in your mind, and then day by day move them from your mind to your heart, they will fundamentally shape you over time into the person God created you to be. Now we're gonna turn our attention today, starting today, to the next set of 10 doors, and each of these 10 doors behind them um, represent the 10 key spiritual practices found in the Bible. They're called also spiritual disciplines. And what we're going to do each week is to give you the key to each one of these doors so that you can open them up and discover how to practice your faith or how to train spiritually so that you can win at life. That's what we are going to be doing. And I need to ask you a question. Are you ready for that? Does anybody in this room, anybody hearing my voice, want to be a winner? All right, I believe you, so let's pray, and then we'll get right to work. we got a lot to do today. Father, I thank you for the opportunity of speaking to these folks, and I just pray that, uh, that I don't get in the way of what you want to say to everybody that is, uh, that is here, everyone who's watching online, that the power of your word would pierce their soul, and they would experience the, the wind in their sails for this uh, beginning of this new year like never before. We pray this in the name of Jesus, and everybody shouted. Amen. When I was a little boy uh, growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, I came from a, a lower middle class family. We lived on the east side of Cleveland in a duplex uh, up and down. And we lived in an old uh, drafty, uh, sort of damp, uh, cold house. And I remember distinctly uh, in my bedroom, it was a bunk bed, I, my brother was on the top, I was on the bottom, uh, there was this large uh, metal grate, a vent, uh, that the heat would come out of. We had no air conditioner back in those days, kids. And uh, this is that big, kind of scary, great vent that was painted over uh, 50 times. And, um, and when I was a boy, uh, I had no concept that below the, the vent there was a basement. Uh, what I remembered is hearing these sounds when everything was quiet and and, and, and I heard, I heard, uh, particularly at night when everything was quiet, I heard monsters and creatures in that vent working and clanging. As a matter of fact, I have a picture of me when I was a boy, uh, and there is that scary grate, and behind that grate down were the creatures and the monsters, and every night when everything was quiet, I could hear them I could hear them working. And I just knew that at, at one day, uh, they were gonna come out of that grate and they were going to get me. And um, one particular night, it was in the winter time, everything was quiet and I heard them working. And they got louder and they got louder and they got louder and I convinced myself that this was the night they were coming up out of the grate and they're going to take me down. And so in one split second, I jumped out of the bed and I ran with all of my might into my parents' room. I jumped right in the middle of them. 
Now, my dad was in the front by the door, and my mom was in the back, and whenever they, they laid on their sides, it created a great wall. And as I laid there, I knew that the monsters were still there, but it didn't matter anymore because my dad, who was closest to the door, my dad was stronger and bigger and badder than all of the monsters and the creatures. I knew that, and within a few moments, I fell fast asleep in complete peace. This first spiritual practice that we are going to talk about today, at the very core, in summary, it is just like that. When we are experiencing fear and anxiety and doubt in our lives, the best thing for us to do is to run toward the arms of God, knowing that God is bigger than all of our fears all of our anxieties, and all of our doubts. Can I get an amen? amen. The, the practice is called worship. And the word worship comes uh, from the uh, word worth-ship. Worth-ship. And therefore, what worship is, in its basic meaning, is the act of ascribing worth to someone or something. Worth is ascribing worth to someone or something. Worship of God is declaring from our hearts that God is worthy of our worship. Now, God is worthy whether or not we declare it or not. But when we declare it with our own souls that God is worthy through our worship, something happens inside of us something good. And what we're going to discover today as we uncover this first spiritual practice is that we need worship more than God needs our worship. And so on page 175 of your Believe book, if you bought it, if you're new, you might want to pick one of these up. Um, we're going to be asking and answering this key question today. How do I honor God in a way that he deserves? How do I honor God in a way he deserves? So I trolled through the Bible from Genesis to the maps, looking at all the passages that deal with the subject of worship, and I've summarized it in this key idea. We're going to put it on the screen. I want you to say it out loud with me and memorize it by the end of the service. Ready? I worship God for who he is and what he has done for me. What I'd like to do now is to take this in three parts. I worship God, part one. Part two, for who he is. Part three, and what he has done for me. And I'd like to do it using our key passage uh, in Psalm chapter 95. It's on page 176 of your Believe book or in your Bible in Psalm uh, 195. We're going to start with, I worship God. I worship God. Now, the psalmist begins by saying, Come, let us sing for joy. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us extol him with music and song. Here, the psalmist is telling us how we worship. And in this particular context, it's all about music and singing. He says that we are to shout for joy, I mean, sing for joy, shout aloud. We are to offer thanksgiving, and we are to extol him with music and song. Extol. How many of you use that in a sentence this week? The word extol simply means praise taken to another level. Praised, notched up, just a few rungs in the ladder. In my early years of ministry, when contemporary Christian music was just coming out, um, uh, people, I remember in the early days, would criticize the use of contemporary Christian music uh, in worship services, suggesting that it was not reverent, that worship needed to be reverent, uh, meaning that it needed to be quiet and orderly and not so much rock and roll and certainly no drums. <laughs> but here the psalmist is suggesting to us that we need to engage in what I'm simply calling irreverent, irreverent worship. Singing for joy. You don't do that mumbling. Shouting aloud. 
over the drums. Getting your worship on is basically what he's saying. There was an elderly guy in, in, in my last church in San Antonio that wore a t-shirt almost every Sunday to church. Uh, maybe some of you need to get this one. If you think the music's too loud, you're too old. <laughs> you may prefer quieter, reverend music, but theologically, it is spot on to get a little crazy, the psalmist says, when we worship. When we think of the new King David, Right after he was successfully able to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant from the Philistines and it brought it back to Jerusalem, representing the presence of God, we are told that the new King David, who had a heart after God himself, it says in the text in, in first, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6 that, um, that he was dancing before the Lord with all of his might, come on, with shouts and sounds of trumpets right down the middle of the street. And Micah, his wife, didn't like it. And she challenged him, saying that it was inappropriate for him to be half-dressed naked, going down the middle of the streets in front of all the girls and worshiping. And this is what David said in 2 Samuel 6. He said, I will celebrate before the Lord, woman. No, he didn't say woman, but I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. I will be humiliated in my own eyes. That is irreverent worship. We ask people on social media, what is one of the ways that they best connect with God? And a number of you responded to it, but I particularly love the way at Shabby Chick X3 responded. She says, I worship best when I'm in the kitchen, baking, dancing, and praising. I love that. Here's a woman that is not making um, cream-filled donuts She's making spirit-filled donuts. I like that. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, is one of the many places we're told that worship is more than just music and singing. Uh, it says to us that in everything we do, we should do it in an act of worship to God. But we see in the Bible, in the Old and the New Testament, worship and singing is the primary way on which we are invited by God to worship. And it caused me to ask the question, why did God choose music and singing as the primary way in which he wants to receive worship from us? And um, the answer is that I have discovered that God has hardwired us for music and for singing, and modern research today has proved it in spades. They are calling music the secret language of the heart. Research tells us that when we sing, it releases a bonding hormone that God created us with called oxytocin, which is referred to in, uh, in, the, in the research field, in the medical profession, as the cuddle hormone. That's why a mom or a dad who has a baby, wants to put the baby to sleep, wants them to rest, will sing them a lullaby. When the mom or dad sings a lullaby, it releases the oxytocin, the cuddle hormone, in both the parent and the child and makes them feel close. It makes them feel safe. And so when we worship God with music and song, it releases the cuddle hormone in us and gives us that sense, like nothing else we can do, that we are in fact close to God. Worship through music and song draws us by God's design closer to him. In the research, we also saw this. Music can invoke the deepest emotions in people and help us process fear, grief, sadness, and resentment even if these emotions are held on the subconscious level. We also notice that singing, and the research shows, and not only singing, but even moving with the music has a tremendous benefit to our brain, to our mind, and to our heart. Now keep in mind, the researchers said here, the act, it is in the act of singing itself, not how well you sing. Studies have demonstrated that singing, listen to this, that singing can be used to decrease stress, anxiety, and depression. So if you can't carry a tune, but you like to sing, and someone gives you that look or invites you to stop, 
You just say to them, listen, I'm all stressed out and I'm just trying to get calm. Leave me alone, right? God knew all of this when he created us. It's, it's, he created our minds. He created our hearts. He created our bodies to respond to singing so that when that singing is directed towards him, research now proves what God had in mind in the very beginning. It draws us closer to him and gives us great peace and great comfort. But the truth is, we don't need many classes in church to teach people how to worship. The truth is, we were born to worship. It is in our DNA. Let me give you a couple examples. Uh, the first one is, um, is uh, this. Let me show you a group of people who clearly are worshiping, okay? Now, this is a Metallica concert. <laughs> and there was no training or preparation for these thousands of people on how to worship. This is a kind of worship service that King David would have felt very comfortable at. Now, uh, worship's not only at concerts, but uh, the art of celebration is something that we don't have to teach many people. Let me draw an example closer to home. Take a look at this. The folks in Kansas City take us to kick off. Now, this might be a little odd to some people, maybe a little offensive. I get that. That's not my point. My point is that there was no training of these people uh, on celebrating their chiefs. As a matter of fact, this particular event went down in, it's in the Guinness Book of World Records to actually hit the highest decibel level of any public event in human history. These people in KC know how to celebrate. They know how to worship. And February the 3rd is going to even take us to another level. Can I get an amen? Now, here's my, here's my point. The real key is not in the how, but in the who. Get that? The real key is not in the how, but in the who. Who we worship. The psalmist in the very next verse is going to tell us why he chooses to direct his worship, his shouting aloud to the Lord. I worship God for who he is. Take a look at verse three. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. If you're, you've got a pencil, and either in your Bible or your believe book, circle that first word, for. He's basically giving us the reason why he is directing his worship toward God. And the reason is because he is the God above all other gods. He is saying that all the other gods that we have the potential to worship in our life, whether uh, objects or whether beings, do not have the power to deliver on their promise the way the one true God does. And therefore, I'm banking all of my hope and all of my worship toward the one true God. And so when we worship God through song, we worship him for who he is. We recite and we remind ourselves, who is this God 
that we worship. He is love. He is grace. He is mighty. He is savior. He is helper. He is counselor. He is comforter. I love the new song out on the, the, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. You came and, and, the, and the bridge to the song, the, 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 the words are, you are a miracle working God. And he just says it over and over again. You are a miracle working God. And you know the reason I sing it, you know, the reason is because I need a miracle. I need a miracle in my life. And God is the one who performs miracles. And therefore, I worship him for that. So let's continue. I worship God for who he is and finally what he has done for me. We go back to the psalm again and the psalmist writes in verse six, come, let us bow in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He goes back to the subject of how do we worship again? Here he shifts the mode of worship from music to posture. And here he shifts it from being irreverent to reverent. The idea of bowing down, the idea of kneeling is an acknowledgement of sovereignty and of power to the one you kneel and bow down to. When we bow, when we kneel, we are submitting our lives into the hands of the one that we face. The psalmist will go on later to say, be still and know that I am God. Idolatry throughout the Bible is when we choose to take a knee to anybody but God. And here again, the psalmist in the next verse is going to tell you why he only bows down. He only kneels before the Lord, our maker. Look in verse seven again. He starts with the word for. I want you to circle the word for. He's getting ready to tell you why. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. That's why. Now, in the Bible, uh, throughout the Bible, uh, in here in this psalm, uh, um, the, the, uh, we are often compared or, or to uh, a flock of sheep. And the question is why? Why are we compared to a flock of sheep? And uh, the answer is pretty simple because sheep, let us just put it this way, are not the brightest light bulb in the chandelier. Uh, sheep are, and kids don't use this word at home, sheep are, well, they're stupid. Right? That's not a word to say anywhere else, but I can say it in church because these, these, these animals are not really very smart. They're vulnerable. They have many, many predators. A sheep, while they're grazing, will graze themselves off of course and get lost, and they can't find their way back like my beagle dog always was able to do. A sheep, they've done, uh, one farmer did some study on, on his uh, flock of sheep. He had them in the pen with a wire fence, no water in the pen. On the other side of the fence, was a big pool of water and all the sheep just went up to there and looked at the water. Then the gate was right next to him here. He went and he opened the gate so they could get to the water and they just stood there. And he said they would have stood there until they died. The Bible says we are like sheep who have gone astray and there is no way we can survive without the shepherd with his mighty hand and his fierce love. He watches over us and he protects us. And listen to this in our worship of God. When we attribute worth to God, we attribute worth to ourselves because we belong to him. That's what the psalmist is saying. He gets it. He believes it. We are his people. We are his flock. We are his children. And when in our worship we rehearse what he has done for us, here's what happens to our soul. We are reminded that he has been there for us in the past, and therefore he will get us through what we are facing now. You think of some of your favorite worship songs in the last couple years. One of the songs that has gotten me through is no longer slaves where I declare who I am. I'm no longer a slave to fear. No, I am a child of God. I am no longer a slave to fear, which is a good summary of my life. I'm no longer a slave to that because I'm a child of God. I'm known as a singer, not a good singer, but someone who sings perpetually. 
If I am not talking, I am singing. The only time I stop singing or talking is when I sleep, of which my wife says, no, you continue to do that in your sleep as well. 99% of the time, because I'm dialed in on this concept of worship, 99% of the time I am singing worship songs. The other 1%, I'm breaking out a little James Taylor and George Strait. I'm just going to be honest with you, right? But 99% of the time, and even in this season of my life, I'm just telling you, I go to the West Side playlist on Spotify, and I am like putting it down in the car. I'm putting it down everywhere I go. And it's been good for me, and it's been helpful. There's also been seasons of my life It's time for me to kind of peel back some of the layers of my brokenness where I have experienced a lot of stress and a lot of struggle. One particular season uh, was a season of betrayal from a couple good friends. And I experienced a lot of great loss from that. Maybe you've been in that spot. Initially, because I didn't know what they did, Um, I was beating myself up, particularly at night, literally pounding my fist in the pillow, blaming myself until it was exposed what a really good friend did to me. Now I found myself freed from blaming myself, but I found that betrayal was even deeper and hurtful to my soul. Uh, Something triggered in me. A darkness overcame me. The voices in my head were beating me down and they got louder and louder and all of a sudden one day I lost my song I literally stopped singing I didn't know that I did but my wife came to me and said you're not singing anymore are you okay and I remember a day I was in my home office I said to her no honey I'm not okay I'm in big trouble something's happening on the inside of me and I can't stop it and that day continued on for quite some time and I I dove deeper and deeper into a place of depression I mean I was clinically depressed this is not a a term that I use as a non-professional this is the term that my psychiatrist used of me I could barely get out of bed in the morning even though I couldn't sleep I doubted myself I had no sense of a future I lost an unseen amount of weight I actually felt ashamed that I had gotten into this place And couldn't get out of it as a pastor and a Christian author. Why can't I just simply apply some of the messages that I've given to other people about pulling themselves up from the bootstraps? It wasn't working for me. I felt ashamed. I felt like a fake. I felt like a poser. Would anybody listen to me again? And I saw the fear growing on Roseanne's face about where this might eventually take our family. And I went to my doctor, uh, a Christian doctor, and over this next year, this, this, this whole year, he became my pastor. He pastored me through this. By the way, you don't have to be a pastor to pastor people. You get that? There's people right now in your work, in your neighborhood, in your family that need a good pastor. And he prescribed a couple things to me, exercise. He prescribed medications. But interestingly enough, my Christian doctor actually prescribed worship to me. And so I got after it. Every single day, seven days a week, I got up and I ran, I showered, I went to the front porch, I opened up the Psalms, I read them, I journaled the best I could, and then I tried to start singing. And at first it would not come. I forced it, but little by little, the song came back. And today, I'm singing again. He took me out of the darkness of despair and he drew me closer to himself and he reminded me that all of my fears and my anxieties and all my doubt, that he was bigger than all of them if I'll just snuggle up close to him. It actually works. Some of you have been where I've been. Some of you are there right now and some of you will one day be there. It's just called life. I have a a key challenge for us. It's something on my heart. And I want you to write it down. For Westside to be known, 
as a worshiping congregation. For the day to come when the people of the community say, those West Siders, they worship like King David. They are a congregation after God's own heart. I don't know the identity of the creatures or the monsters in your basement. But I tell you the truth. God is bigger than all of them. And my recommendation to you is to dash out of the place where you're currently at with all of your might and run straight into the arms of God. This, my friends, is one of the keys to living a successful life. It is called the practice of worship. And today we unlock the key to it and open it up. Say it with me. I worship God for who he is and what he has done for me. And now that you know that, I challenge you to actually walk through it. And when you do, what you're going to discover is the trophy is on the other side. It won't be a baseball trophy, but it will be something even better. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.